Today is Friday, June 13th, 2014. My name is Jason Higgins, and I'm an intern with the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program at the OSU Library. I'm in Stillwater today to interview Charles Russell and discuss his life experiences, including his service in the United States military. This is part of the Spotlighting Oklahoma Oral History Project, and along with me today is Mr. Russell. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you. Mr. Russell, last Friday when we ended our first session, we were discussing your transition from being a pilot of the B-24 <laughs> Liberator, flying missions over, over Germany in World War II, to your return to the United States. Let's begin today with your de decision to attend Oklahoma State University. Well, in the first place, uh, they enacted the... Uh, uh, what do they call it? The GI Bill? <laughs> GI Bill. <laughs> and uh, I thought, well, boy, that's a chance to go to college because I knew I wasn't going to go to college after uh, after high school because I didn't have the money. But so I liked the Air Force and would like to have stayed in, but I also wanted to get out and get some. You're fine. Uh, You're fine. You can keep going. Okay. And get some more education. So, at the when I came home in uh, December of 1944, of course the war was still on, and I was uh, not discharged until after the war was over. And uh, I was discharged the next November. And in the meantime, I was out in uh, Utah and Idaho training guys, still, the Air Force is still training people to go to war someplace, you know, mm -hmm. because the war wasn't over. And I was an instructor there in Boise, Idaho when the war uh, ended. And so then I, after being separated, I came home and uh, got ready to go to Stillwater. That was the only school I could think of that I wanted to go to. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, I enrolled in, in uh, the second semester for in 1946. Uh, of course, the war was over in 45. And uh, I was uh, undecided of whether I should, of what I wanted to take. Uh, I liked to be in agriculture, and I also liked uh, scientific things or engineering. Mm -hmm. And so, but well, anyway, I rode in agriculture and started, and then after one semester of that, why it was seemed to be rather elementary, so I uh, <laughs> changed over to, to engineering, mm, mechanical engineering, and I went uh, uh, through the summer school uh, and August intersection, and then the next semester, the fall semester of 46, and then in 47, uh, I was recalled. All this time I was a reserve uh, pilot and used to fly out of Oklahoma City in training. Go down there and fly a little bit. And uh, I was recalled to go to school to study to be a communications officer. The Air Force decided they were short of people that knew something about communications. Mm -hmm. And so I went to Scott Field and finished there and transferred to Tucson, Arizona. At that time, uh, the Air Force had another build-up thing. It seemed like it goes like this all the time. <laughs> build up, sit down, build up, sit down. And 
<laughs> uh, <coughs> they were building up the Strategic Air Command because of fear of Russia attacking us, which they, they had no plans to do anyway. Uh, so uh, after a short time there, why I applied for a, uh, a tour of uh, to which would lead to a regular commission. I was a reserve, had a reserve commission, and uh, this was to go on for one year and you be in a tactical unit and different jobs, and each job that you were, you had, you got rated on it, and then at the end, while they decided whether they're going to give you a regular commission or not. So, uh, anyway, before I got into that thing, why, I was transferred then to the Far East, and I left Tucson and went to Hamilton Field in uh, California, and the time I got there, why this application I had in for competitive tour, they called it, caught up with me, and they just couldn't decide whether they were going to send it back t to uh, Tucson or send me on. So while I was waiting, <laughs> I waited there for about a month for them to decide. Finally, they said, oh, we'll send you on over to uh, Far East. So I went to Japan, and the idea was I would, to complete my competitive tour in Japan, but it had to be in a tactical unit, and I was assigned to a a uh, photo recon outfit that was taken post hostility pictures all over the country, J oh, Japan, Korea, uh, Philippines, the Dusty Indies, and just after I got checked out in the airplane that they were using for the photography, why well, they sent me to Manila. Oh, yeah in the Philippines. And just as soon as I got off the plane there, they sent me down <laughs> to the Dutch East Indies, to the island of the Celebes. Mm. And uh, with, I went down there with uh, myself and seven enlisted men to set up a camp. And they're just gonna break two airplanes down there later. And we're just gonna fly those airplanes out of this little town of Mandado in northern Celebes. Mm -hmm. And uh, the enlisted men then would take care of maintenance of the airplanes and uh, take care of the uh, taking the, the film out the airplane out of the cameras. We had lots of cameras in those airplanes and ever once a week they would bring down supplies to us and pick up the film and take it back to, him, to Manila. I see. And we stayed there about, about a month of, and they decided that they were going to send down a smaller airplane to finish up the work we were doing. And they sent down a, a man and uh, several enlisted men to support this. And we went back. Mm -hmm. uh, it was uh, three airplanes of us, and we went back to the Philippines, and then staying there about two weeks while they said on back to Japan. What three time frame was this? This was in the 47. 47. Yeah. And you said you were taking post-conflict pictures? Post-hostility pictures. Post-hostility. They took, we took the pictures and they made them into maps uh -huh. because that, cut, that part of the country had very few maps. They found out during World War II. All those islands in the Philippines and, and Korea and uh, Hokkaido mm -hmm. and all of that. So we took all those pictures and, and the Army made the, made the maps of using the, the pictures. Oh, okay. Interesting. And so, 
the pictures had to be pretty precise, uh, otherwise they couldn't make it into a big map. You know, mm -hmm. if we had a long string of, of uh, pictures, they had to have just a, a certain amount of overlap, and no more this way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so we were taking them from uh, high altitude, 20,000 feet. Some of them, or a lot of them, were 10,000 feet. And even some got down to five. That was pretty nice to fly to five, <laughs> instead of 30,000 feet. <laughs> so. What would the difference be with the altitude? Well, would that be nicer? Oh, it's cold up there. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to have the on oxygen, of course. Mm. And uh, so. Well, the plane flies all flies all right, but uh, it's uh, just more comfortable flying down low. So anyway, I wish I could get rid of that saying in a in a way. That's like a lot of people say, uh, and so you know. We all have them. <laughs> and, I'd like to get rid of that. <laughs> we would. Um, so this interrupted your schooling in OSU this time? No, I had to tell, uh, uh, yes, I only went to school, uh, well, it's old A&M, mm -hmm. Oklahoma A&M, for one year, and then I went back in the service, oh, and I then I did, uh, it was in 50, Six that the Air Force uh, decided they needed some more engineers, mm -hmm. so they sent me back here to uh, at that. It's still A and M, and the time we graduated, it was OSU, oh, I see. and so I went two years here to and finished engineer degree. I see. What was it like during your first year at A and M? Can you describe what the campus was like? Oh, it's fun! <laughs> oh yeah, uh, I, I, uh, I was one of the few people that had a car, and uh, I, I couldn't start it without being full of kids. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we we had lots of fun. And what and, were some of the activities that you guys? Did? Oh well, the. Uh, uh, parties and the dances and all the girls are pretty and uh, so uh, <laughs> I guess I probably shouldn't talk about it but you drive around the old uh, road around the, the campus up there and you see kids going to school mm -hmm. Flip flops on, short pants. I mean, shorts, and the boys all full of beard, and and when I went to school here the first time, why everybody, all the boys most of wore Levi's mm -hmm. and an uh, orange shirt, a shirt that had been ironed, and the girls all wore. Uh, those shoes with uh, white and saddles, you know, saddle shoes mm -hmm. and skirts. And yeah, that was really nice, you know. You wouldn't dream of going to school. I mean, you're going to class it the other way. So anyway, there it goes again. <laughs> so uh, is this during the time that you met your second wife? Huh? Did you meet your, your second wife at A&M? That no, was the first wife. I recall you talking about dances with the. Uh, yeah, well, uh, when the f in the first semester here, the studies weren't that uh, demanding, and so I decided, well, I could do some work and make a little extra money. So I went to to a school a place where they uh, hired kids to work around the campus and the flowers and. Grasses and stuff like that, you know. Mm. And I went in there, 
and there was a good looking girl running the thing. <laughs> and so she said I got to flirt with her. <laughs> Which I probably did. <laughs> anyway, she gave me a job of 50 cents an hour of uh, working around the campus, hoeing the, in the, the flowers and, and stuff like that. Mm. And so we started dating and there's some of the pictures. <clears throat> Up there we went to dances and so forth. And, uh, um, so I went with her dude all the time. I was here the first time. And uh, then uh, I didn't ever see her here. Well, that, well that's another story. For 50 some years, you know. Mm. And that's when I got back with her. Anyway. So how did you meet your first wife? Oh, she was a nurse in the, in the uh, army. Well, at that time, everybody was in the army uh, because we didn't have a separate air force then. And um, she was stationed at Scott, and I was going to school up at Scott. And we got to Dayton, and about two months later, why we decided we'd get married. <laughs> <laughs> and we did. We, we lived together 46 years before she passed away. Mm. We have two children, a boy and a girl. And so, uh, well, let's see. Now, I'm in Japan. <laughs> right. And uh, at the, when I went to, J to uh, the Far East, why I was married, and so my wife came over about uh, five months later, and we lived on the base there at Johnson Air Force Base, and we lived there until the <coughs> Korean War started, and uh, she could have gone home right then, but she decided she just stay, and I was sent over to to Korea to fly. Uh, combat, <laughs> and uh, so she stayed in, the, and she helped other people and families and so forth. With the, uh, whose husband were over in Korea, so forth, and they had a little little group, but they stayed together and helped each other out. Mm. That's pretty nice. And, and then we came back uh, in. 51. We came back to the States and assigned to uh, oh, uh, in Virginia, Fort, uh, well, it's where NASA started out oh, yeah. in uh, Virginia. Mm. I was with NASA, I was with a, a group that was training pilots and crews to go back to Korea. And I was there for two months, I mean for two years, and uh, then a call came and they needed to send one, somebody to uh, Europe. And first time I told my dog, I, I just got back from Japan a long ago. And then they had me nominated for to go to Turkey, and I didn't want to go there at all. <laughs> and so I didn't wasn't picked to go that. And next time they uh, picked me to go to Germany, I said, oh, "Okay, I'll go with you." And so uh, I went to uh, Germany and was there, there for a little over two years. And then uh, I got uh, application in for school that uh, the Air Force had at Wright-Patterson. And uh, so the orders came through for me to, to come on home, because I was eligible to get home. And I had a little trouble getting 
release from my base there, the, the colonel didn't want to let me go. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, he did let me go and we came home in, in 56 and that was in the summertime and we had a new baby born the 10th of June and we, uh, I just got back to the States in time to dump the family off with her folks and I came on to Stillwater to go to school and I went the first uh, semester here just batching by myself mm -hmm. and then Christmas time they came transferred I went back and got them and brought them down here and then uh, I finished uh, uh, school in 58 and I was transferred then to Wright Patterson to do research and development. Where did you live on OSU campus? Did you live on the OSU campus with oh, your no, family? No. no. Oh, off campus. <laughs> I lived uh, at the uh, on 4th Street, oh. right next behind uh, the uh, big brick house that the uh, governor, not the governor, but the other one. The mayor? The, huh? Mayor? I'm not sure. I'm oh, sure. hey. Uh, Right. Well, the house is still there. Oh, okay. And uh, it's on uh, on Fourth Street, right by, just off a of duck. Oh, okay. And so. So, what was it like? The difference um, between being a bachelor in a at A and M and being a <laughs> husband and father at OSU. Heck, uh, they had me so jammed up with studies. And then engineering, you know, I didn't hardly have time to breathe. I had a, a room in the back of the house, and uh, that's where I stayed most of the time. And I never worked so hard in my life. I don't think any worked. I was in the in the Air Force, as I did when I was at two years of engineering. Mm -hmm. I already had a, a degree from the University of Maryland. I got that in Germany by ex the extension that the University of Maryland had in over there in, in uh, Germany. Okay. But I didn't have a lot of the basic requirements for engineering. Mm -hmm. And I had to be taking those courses at the same time I was taking courses that I should have prerequisite for. <laughs> and that's a lot of fun. Yeah. So. Well, I wasn't the only one here. They, they we trained a whole lot of Air Force people here. I sent them to school here. So you had other uh, oh, yeah. Air Force veterans. Oh yeah. Did you guys have a sense of camaraderie whenever oh, you yeah. went to the had program? Oh yeah, we had a meeting ever once a week, and of course we had certain things we had to do, uh, and that was always passed out to all of us, and. Also, you had uh, been able to, for them to help you in courses that uh, were problems that you might be stuck with. And so, mm -hmm. so that was pretty good. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of them were real smart. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm sure you were too. <laughs> um, what were some of your favorite memories during your time at OSU, at A&M or at OSU? Oh, I don't know. I, I liked the... Uh, uh, when I, the first time I was here, I had more free time then, and I enjoyed the the sports, the basketball. We had uh, a real good basketball team under Hank Iba, and the football team. It played. <laughs> we played OU one time, and the score was seventy-two to twelve. <laughs> so, OU. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you won? 
I, I didn't play, but I, you know, I just watched at the game. No, I meant that. Oh, you have the 72. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They had uh, had a real good team that year. Mm. And so... Um, so did you have any favorite professors? Uh, yeah, well, I, I wish I could remember their name. Had one one professor in a real tough course. It was called. Uh, it was a study of uh, flow of uh, oil or gas or whatever in fluids. That's what it was. The name of the course, and that was pretty tough. Yeah. Uh, one day he said, "If you have somebody." to love, and good work to do, and something to believe in, why well, that's the three things that you need for happiness, you know. So, uh, I've always remembered that. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, Dr. Nader was a lot of help. He was, you could go in and see him just about any time you wanted to. He was head of, of Electrical engineering, and he was, he has helped us out a lot. When I first got here, he loaded me up with 22 hours of engineering courses. Wow. And I said, there's no way I can do this. So I didn't even, <laughs> uh, I got the, the book out of the courses they're supposed to take, and I made it my own now. I got it down to 18, and that was enough. Anyway. That's still plenty. Yeah, especially all those engineering courses, uh, electrical engineering courses, had uh, a lot of uh, lab work. And, of course, you had to go two hours of lab to make one of theory. If you had a, a three-hour course, you had six hours lab, you know. And that's a lot. Takes a lot of time. Let's see. So, okay. well, um, so if you don't mind, can we go back to Korea? Go ahead. Um, so you were in Japan. Your wife was in Japan. Yeah. And you went to Korea. Uh, what were your roles and duties in Korea? Well, uh, the uh, outfit I was in assigned to was a flying. Uh, old Air Force advanced trainers airplanes called a T-6 and they were using it for directing close support uh, to the troops. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, you'd fly and find places that you thought there were troops hid in camouflage and so forth. Uh, and you could direct fighter tri strikes on them. Mm -hmm. You didn't have anything on the airplane that was explosive except uh, six mar uh, marker uh, bullets, uh, bullets, but mm -hmm. <laughs> torpedoes. Yeah, and you could fire those, and they didn't go where you wanted to go all the time because they were always had bits, fins, and everything, and they just go. Like this, but they'd be sometimes close. You, if you <coughs> shoot one out there and it hit over here, and the target was over there, you could tell them, well, the target's over here. <laughs> they could see the smoke, you know, mm -hmm. and they could find it that way. But uh, that was uh, when I was flying in England. You weren't very close to the war, except for the little bit of war that was right around you, the people shooting at you and flak and airplanes and so forth. And it wasn't like those guys on the ground, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but over in, when I was in Korea, while well, we were close to the ground troops, in mm -hmm. fact, I had one well, of the guys that flew with me most of the time was a, a artillery captain from the Army. Mm -hmm. And he was pretty good. He could uh, almost give them uh, directions for 
artillery strike by telling them how how much left, how much right, or or forward or backwards, and in tell them in, in stuff they could just crank in, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he was he was pretty good. But we were close to close to the uh, to the war, right. and you could see people getting hit, a lot of them, and you could see the North Koreans. Troops that were shot, and I didn't see that before, you know. Mm -hmm. So you, it's a whole uh, together different. Understand. Uh, so um, I understand that the Chinese, whenever they moved into Korea, um, initially the. They had a lot of American troops around it. Did you, um, like, for example, um, the Battle of Ch Chosan Reservoir? Did yeah. you participate in that battle? Uh, that took place just before I got over there. Oh, okay. Uh, when the North Koreans first came over there, MacArthur decided he had to keep a beachhead over there on. Korea Island. Mm -hmm. So he kept a little place and wasn't very big on one south end of, uh, of South Korea. And then after he had the Incheon landing, why well, then to push them way back up into North Korea. And about that time, the, North, the Jap uh, Chinese came across the Yalu River and drove us back down. <laughs> <laughs> to the 38th parallel, mm -hmm. and that's where they made the stand, and it, it's still standing there. We've never ended that war yet. I mean, never signed any treaties or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So, so you were very close to to the action in Korea yeah. on the ground. Yeah. Did, uh, did yeah. enemy forces ever overrun the camps? No. no? We could we could hear uh, sometimes. Uh, our pillar fire that wasn't very far from our camp, mm -hmm. and we were up close to to Seoul, and we thought we had that pretty well stabilized up there along the Yale River. I mean, along the 38th parallel, and had Seoul pretty well uh, defended, and then the North Koreans all made a big push and came down and we had people living in Kimpo families, Kimpo Airport. Mm -hmm. And they came just about sunup or a little after. And people had to, we were able to evacuate all of the families out of, out of there. But they had to just leave what if they came in the pajamas, well, they got on the airplane and <laughs> left, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and came back to, uh, brought them back to Japan. And then it was a while before we pushed them back again, uh, away from Seoul. Mm -hmm. And this back and forth seemed like. What were your impressions of the civilians? Did you interact with them or did you see them? Uh, the only ones that I saw was we had a, a houseboy in our tent that uh, took care of building a fire mm -hmm. and kind of sweeped it up a little bit so forth. And one of the guys, uh, Went to, uh, back to Japan from there and just on the leave. And he bought a bicycle and he brought it back. He gave it to the houseboy. And boy, you never saw anyone so proud or something. He kept it in the, ha in the tent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so to make sure that no one stole it or anything like that. Yeah. How is he really? He was a young man. Uh, I would say he, he was probably. Uh, Maybe 15, something like that, 15, 20, 
I mean 15 and 16. Mm -hmm. And he could understand a little English and But I had, that's about the only ones I had contact with. Okay. Um, now to think. Did uh, what time? What season was it? What was the climate like? Colder than. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, get out. <laughs> yeah, look, I know. Uh, it was in the winter time, and I don't know whether. You want to put this in there or not? Uh, anyway, the uh, latrines, you know what the latrines mm -hmm. were, were just a big tit and uh, had a big hole dug and a, the places where you sit down were all nice and wood and everything. But it was so cold that you <laughs> didn't <laughs> Terry very long out there. I bet. <laughs> you didn't take a magazine out there to read. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so other than the climate, what was difficult about your time in Korea? What was most challenging for you? Oh, I don't know. I, we had comfort things. Like uh, the tent was warm, had adequate food, and uh, we clothing, and uh, so except for flying up there when they shoot at you, that's <laughs> the things was you uh, had to worry about. So was that ground defenses shooting at you? Yeah. Well, we, we had to fly low where we could see what was going on. And uh, they could shoot at you with, uh, with rifles. And, mm -hmm. and uh, if they hit you in the vital part of the airplane, why, you might be landing up there close to them. And a lot of them did get shot down that way. Mm -hmm. I got lots of holes in the, in the wings. And then the fuselage in places that didn't matter, didn't hurt anything. And you take the thing back uh, to the base, and they'd patch those holes with beer cans. We didn't, we didn't have our <laughs> supplies over there, or pieces of aluminum, and except uh, maybe the crashed airplane, they could uh, cut some aluminum off of it. But, uh, a lot of the airplanes had beer can patches, hmm. and that was good enough. Right. So, so it sounds like your experience in Korea was much different than your time during oh, World War gotcha. II. Oh, gosh, yeah, yeah. What other major differences did, can you think of? Well, you were flying, uh, we were flying two missions a day. Uh, and uh, if you had the early mission, you got, got up about three o'clock. And uh, as soon as you got back and had lunch, you got ready to go again. Mm -hmm. you could, uh, and you'd be home about uh, two in the afternoon. Uh, and then when you had the late mission, well, you could sleep till maybe eight or nine o'clock. And uh, you didn't get back till after dark. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, it just rotated that way all, all the time. So, well, I, I guess uh, if you're survive, well, you don't mind <laughs> a lot of that stuff anyway. So how did you get through day to day? You fly a lot of various missions. Did what kept you going? <laughs> Operations officer, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> yeah, <same. laughs> 
Just something you had to do then. It's something we had to do. Oh, we, I remember one crew got pretty well shot up and, and they came back and they both, uh, both guys, the pilot and the, the observer, they were ready to quit. <laughs> More yeah. that. But after they had finished that bottle of uh, the scotch, while they got over that when they got feel better. <laughs> <laughs> but you see lots of things uh, that you could talk about, I guess, from the air. Like one time, uh, when I was, we just flew two around all the time. Mm -hmm. And there was a mound of, uh, like a little little mountain, I guess several acres, and it had the uh, uh, looked like streams, river, rivulets running down there, but they were all all real green, and that didn't look natural, and so I <coughs> told a fighter strike to come in there. And they shot some into those le uh, bushes, and they were full of horses and men. They were camouflaged. <laughs> and of course, the horses all ran off, and the men scattered, trying to get away. And they were all North Korean Army. Another time, uh, <clears throat> when the North Koreans were on the move, why our uh, position was to, to pull back, to draw out their uh, support longer, and then counterattack. Anyway, uh, they were pushing back, and the civilians were leaving, marching up the mountain or over the hill, get, trying to get away from that. And my ground observer called and told, said that these were not all civilians, they were, a lot of them are North Koreans, mm -hmm. and said to <coughs> call a strike on them. And I did. And the pilot said, Is that an order? The fighter pilot. I said, Yes. And so he made one pass. He had uh, four airplanes in a flight, and he was the leader. And they made one pass, and they didn't shoot anything, and they just took off and went home. They w wouldn't shoot at him. So that's just the way uh, where it goes, I guess. Some other tough decisions of war. Yeah. Were you relieved that they didn't fire? No. 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 Hmm. Another time uh, the North Koreans were pushing down while they ra overran a unit of British uh, troops and these, these troops, uh, to escape, they went back north and around, and we were going to come down the valley uh, to back to our side. And uh, as they came down this valley, why a tank started up the, the valley, and he saw these troops, and they couldn't, he couldn't tell what the hell they were, and. So he fired at him, and I wanted to communicate with him, but I didn't have any radio contact, and we used to carry what we call message drops, mm -hmm. and a little pocket with a long tail on it, and you throw it out, and it'll go down. Um, so I called another plane. And he had one, and I said, I told him what to write in it. And 
he dropped it to the tank and one of the guys went out and got it. And as soon as they read it, well, they raised the whole rifle, the gun up and took off <laughs> and rescued them all of what was left of them, you know. So it was American forces? They were British forces. Oh, they were British yeah. forces. Mm. Yeah. And they were they fired upon? This was friendly fi a friendly fire situation? Cause well, they didn't know. They couldn't tell. Okay. Hell, when they're over there half a mile away. <laughs> mm. All right. Didn't expect to see them coming down through there. But they marched along. Uh, kind of long trail, the dogs were along each side, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they always had dogs with the troops over there. Mm. And it got a little paragraph about, the, about that high in the uh, Newsweek magazine. <laughs> sure. But, well, uh, I came home uh, from Korea um, in 51 in June, and that's when I was sent back to Virginia. That, that place was Langley Air Force Base in Virginia. And that's where I, I stayed. I said, uh, I was always in the happy of getting to a place, and right away they're going to transfer me someplace else. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, we, we lived there for uh, about six months in at Langley, and then they transferred the whole outfit down to South Carolina, Shaw Air Force Base, mm. and. That was still in uh, Christmas of 51, and we were there at uh, Shaw Air Force Place until we went to Germany in uh, 53. How did that moving around affect your family life? It's really tough on them, it really is. They, I don't, a lot of people don't really appreciate that, I, I don't think, but never uh, experienced it. The other day, one of the guys in my, I had breakfast with on Thursday, he decided to, he's, a, one of the guys there is a retired professor from OSU, and he's building a new house. And the house that he moved out of, selling, that's the first house that he bought when he came to OSU <laughs> years ago. And he has, that's the first move he's had, you know. Uh, but uh, we moved all the time. And it's not, it's not really fun for the family. family uh, because everything is disrupted uh, for a long time for you. While you're getting packed up and ready to move and then trying to get settled in the place you go to. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, a lot of families separate because of that, all that moving around. And, so, hell, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So, next stop, Germany. Well, uh, in Germany, uh, we were, uh, I was in a, another photo recon outfit, and uh, we were uh, not taking pictures to make maps out of, we were there to support troops taking uh, these pictures 
for intelligence and so forth. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, three squadrons, and one of the squadrons was a night photo. It, it uh, would fly over the area and drop a, a big bomb that had a parachute on it, and it would uh, light up the ground enough that they could take pictures mm -hmm. of anything on the ground. And the tactical nature, and uh, I was assigned then uh, to be the communications officer because I had been in this communications school and for the group and taking care of all of the uh, communications that the airplanes required uh, from um, approach control, tower control, and runway control. And the runway control is not uh, an item that's issue, of issue. Most of them are built, and I think I've built more of them than anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> and they, you never have the right equipment to go into it, but the idea of having the runway control out here, and this is the runway over here, and they have a pilot in there on runway control duty, and he is in communications with the pilot that's going to land, and he gives him directions, and if, if need be, tell him about the wind is, and, and uh, whether it's directly down or crosswind or whatever. And so we had to build another one of those uh, runway controls and put the radios in there. And we built the Germans uh, built for us a runway control, not a runway control, but that a approach control uh, with a radar and they could put them on the hill. We, the, the housing and everything was way up here on the hill and the runway was down way down there. And where they were going to put this uh, radar, it wasn't high enough to, you know, all he got was ground clutter. And so I said, well, how don't we just put up on stakes, middle of the pie? And they thought, well, that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they, they did, they built up concrete uh, legs and then filled this all in with dirt. And it was just a big mound of dirt, mm -hmm. about 15 foot high. And that solved the problem. And they had, approach control Same. and I had some control of the uh, telephone system in the, for the base and that was uh, kind of interesting <laughs> and so but anyway, I did I was in that job uh, all the time I was there and that, uh, since I wasn't uh, on one of the pilots, uh, on training all the time, they, have, they flew training missions all the time. And so I, I had the time you know, to go to school at the University of Maryland at night. And the pilot may be set off on uh, down to Africa or someplace on tactical training missions and so forth. And I never had to go on those. So you're on the ground for the majority uh, yeah. of the time. Yeah. Um, were you in Berlin? I've been to Berlin. I, I, uh, uh, I never did fly up there or, or go on a bomb mission or anything like that. Right. What were your impressions of Berlin during that time? Oh. Great, beautiful. <laughs> so it, it had already been rebuilt. 
uh, after. Well, well, they were they they were rebuilding it. Uh, uh, this was in uh, well, in the time I was in Germany. Uh, Fifty-three to fifty-six, uh, somewhere in there. Uh, at that time, uh, German, i mean Berlin—was under uh, in the Russian zone. Mm -hmm. But Berlin itself was controlled by uh, United States, British, French, and German. In Russia. I mean, uh, Russian. Mm -hmm. uh, so, to go to to Berlin, you had to get a ticket on train, and you got on the train in uh, I think it was no, Wiesbaden. Well, anyway, you get on the train, and the train is sealed. You can't get off of it. Mm. Till you get to Berlin, and so we got to Berlin. It was only there for uh, to, uh, the weekend, looking for antiques and so forth. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and join and visiting the nightclubs, and the, so. Uh, it was it was a nice nice trip. Uh, my wife never never to go up there. Some of the wives did, but it was quite a hassle for them. Well, they they erected the wall during around that time, did they not? Oh yeah, right. The wall was already up at that time. Okay. Yes. Let's see. And this was uh, this was five years after the Berlin Airlift. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, this is con uh, this is right in the middle of the Cold War. Yeah. And you were training pilots during yeah. this time. What were some of the tactics and what were some of the procedures in the event the pilot crashed? Do you do you recall any of those training uh, uh, what how were pilots trained in the event that they were shot down? Uh, by the Soviets. Uh, what were some of the, the Cold War training procedures? <laughs> well, uh, since I was uh, the communications officer, they someone had decided that we needed to have some way to identify or to pick up a low-flying airplanes across the, the border. They had radar to up there to catch them up here. I mean to see them, and so the idea was they would they called it a, an acoustic fence, and they were going to put uh, poles up here with uh, microphones on it. And if a plane come this way, they could would set off an alarm uh, someplace, and if it's going this, back this way, why it wouldn't set it off? And had a German scientist, Doctor So and So, from Siemens, and an engineer, electrical engineer, and a driver, and each each one of those, <laughs> uh, I had to escort them around all the time. They had a class system. This doctor was in one class, engineer was in another, and the driver and a helper was in another. And I used to go to lunch with them, and they would go to uh, one of the German restaurants, and you could tell what each one of them ordered. This, the doctor he had ordered, you know, the best thing I had, <laughs> and this one here, a little bit less, and this down here. <laughs> uh, <it's>, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, that was kind of interesting. It never got built, but uh, they did pick up all of the 
the, the information that they needed uh, to build it, but then then you build it. Well, all of uh, every, all of the guys in the group, pilots and so forth, had been um, nearly all of them were World War II pilots, mm. not nearly all of them, and they were pretty well trained, but they were just training uh, on their, in their tactics uh, for the, the case that they were called to support the uh, ground troops. Mm. And uh, people were, <coughs> the civilians uh, that are over there, lots of wives and children and, and so forth, over, over there <coughs> with their sponsor, and they didn't worry too much about the uh, Russian company, but some of the higher ups thought that the Russians were going to attack any day, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Which, and the, uh, the Swiss couldn't understand why we were so uptight about the Russians' uh, attacks. So, so they couldn't sustain it for long anyway. And uh, they're just a paper shell, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they were probably right. So, ten years before, you would have been flying missions, bombing strategic locations in Germany. What was it like going back ten years later and then being on the ground in Germany? Can you describe that feeling? Well, I never did visit in the places that that I was on bombing, but uh, I've seen uh, the results of. Uh, some of the bombing that was done, and uh, they did an awful lot of, of very good work at cleaning up all that. They've been at it, uh, I guess, uh, World War Two <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, everything. So, but you can still see lots of evidence of where the bombing is set, except I mean, especially in the the uh, in the towns, mm -hmm. knocking down the old buildings, and, and they did a, an awful good job of cleaning up and building roads and bridges back and so. That's and, yeah. Um, how did the the German civilians, the population, react uh, to American presence there? Oh, oh they they liked us. <laughs> you couldn't you couldn't find any of them that was a Nazi. <laughs> well, of course not. Not by that time. <laughs> no, uh, uh, we we got along real fine with with all of the the Germans. Uh, I thought all that I came in contact with. Uh, so uh, they were happy that we were there, and uh, some of them would talk a little bit about. How awful Hitler was, but uh, not too too much. Mm. They just they were someplace else when the war. <laughs> mm -hmm. and although when I was <coughs> taking German in the University of Maryland in that extension course, it was taught by a German, and he had been a gunner on. Uh, a German uh, bomber, hmm. and uh, he, he would we would talk about it. He, really? Yeah, yeah. He, he. Do you recall any of your discussions? No, not not really. Uh, uh, he was a uh, working on his PhD, and he said in German. Universities, uh, the professor may look 
out the first day and see uh, 20 or 30 people lined up there for it. So he assigns a real tough uh, assignment for the next time they meet, and he'll find out there's only about six or seven of them will be there. <laughs> <laughs> and he'd get rid of, he'd say, he'd say well, well, we got rid of all the other seven, now let's get to work. <laughs> And this uh, this guy, this, I was taking, he was teaching the German class. He could speak about six or seven languages, and he said, "What are the toughest one to that he ran across was uh, uh, the language that they have in Iceland." He said, "They Iceland. they don't have any vowels." It's all hard of uh, costless, you know. mm -hmm. and he said transferring, uh, translating Russian to Icelandic and then to English is quite a job. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Yeah, his name was oh heck, I had it on him. A while ago, he was a pretty nice guy, and he carried me along and kept me from flunking. <laughs> hmm. I'm not very good at languages, so, but it was kind of fun to take it anyway. Mm -hmm. So, um, any favorite memories while you were there before we move on? No. Uh, I enjo uh, enjoyed uh, being there in Germany. Uh, and I guess that's about all I can <laughs> Right. So, after your time in Germany, where did you go next? Huh? Where did you go after Germany? Oh, um, well, that's when I came back here to OSU. Oh, for yeah. Two years of engineering classes. Absolutely. And, and then after I got the, the engineering degree, well, then I was assigned to Wright Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. Mm -hmm. And that's where. Uh, they do a lot of research and and whatnot, and just after I got there, while well, the rumors were that we were going to move to Boston, and we did, <laughs> <laughs> and so we was only in in uh, Ryan Patterson for I guess a year or two years, and then we transferred to Boston and we were still uh, in Boston we were developing uh, and installing uh, our defense system and they thought that the Russians were going to come across there with a whole bunch of airplanes like we went to Germany with and they did air defense system and we designed have radar and communications and at all the these sites all the way from up in Alaska across Canada and down to Germany and this up up in Alaska and northern Canada was called the dew line uh, defense, something like that, anyway. Uh, and our part was down in Germany, and it was a more a tactical situation. And we had sites all, all Germany and radar and so forth, made lots of trips to cross the Atlantic and to Germany. And, during the process of 
the developing and installing these things. We, uh, the Air Force, was uh, <clears throat> just sort of monitoring the contractors. We had contractors, uh, GE, uh, Westinghouse, uh, North Electric for telephones, and uh, maybe some more. And we, each one of Westinghouse was providing all the radars. GE was uh, in charge of, of, the, of this whole, getting this whole system together and also pr producing some of the, the equipment, the computer, the computers and so forth. And it was all, all really interesting. And then the whole thing just faded away. No, and with the, the fall of the air. Uh, yeah. And there's one story uh, up in uh, Greenland, up in Thule, they built a great big uh, radar that was fixed, pointed towards Russia. And um, they called it the Oh well, uh, it was just on a great big uh, rack and screen, and the radars looking out that way, and brought the information back to the control system, and they turned it on, and all of a sudden, uh, the alarm went off, and they were all scrambling around. This radar had picked up a tremendous amount of, of airplanes before coming in. And after a little bit, well, they decided that it was the moon <laughs> coming up over there. <laughs> they forgot to tell the radar that <laughs> the moon <laughs> could reflect mm. the radar. And that's kind of a, a story that they told around. <laughs> <laughs> they call that uh, insulation up there, the muse, B E M E W S. <laughs> and, uh, I was in that outfit uh, seven years, and we finally did get two. Uh, of the sites operational for in Germany. And after the, they were no longer needed for air defense, why they started using them for traffic control, and, which is real good. Mm -hmm. they, at least they put, uh, put them to some use. One of the things we ran across in putting these sites in Germany is land use is very, very controlled. Mm. The same way with with forest, trees and so forth. You can't cut down trees or forest or anything. And to get a, a site to set the radar on, it took a, a lot of uh, uh, negotiation with the uh, uh, German government. I see. Well, they didn't know to. Uh, well, they knew they had to do it to start with, but after, after a while, they got for the when they didn't need it anymore. They put up some other use. So this brings us through Truman, Eisenhower, now we're up to Kennedy. Yeah. Um, talk a, a little bit about the Kennedy era for you. <laughs> oh, let's see. I, uh, Kennedy was elected in 
In 62, right? 60, I think. 60, yeah, 60. Well, Baba, all I remember about uh, him is his talking uh, those Russians down on Cuba. On Cuba. Mm. It was a pretty gutsy thing to do, and we were ready to, to go at it mm. with them. And Khrushchev backed out and went home. But uh, one of the uh, radio communications that we were working on <coughs> before this Korea, before this Cuban war came on, our missile thing came on, uh, was uh, a tactical uh, radio uh, set. We hadn't gotten then where we were bouncing signals off of the satellites, everything had to be on the ground, or close to the ground, and we developed a uh, radar uh, radio system that took two, two of them to communicate, and this one over here could be over the horizon. Uh, and they called it uh, Quadruple uh, oh, shoot. Anyway, it, it was pretty complicated, but it worked. Hmm. <laughs> and when the Korea, uh, the Cuban thing came up, while well, we got those two of those ready for communication, hmm. and uh, they were all set. Set to go, but the, they were needed. Luckily. Unfortunately, <laughs> right. Um, so there was one thing I wanted to step back to okay. momentarily. I brought up presidents, and it reminded me of this. So, um, you the, you were in the military when there were Truman uh, reintegrated or integrated yeah. the military. Yeah. Uh, what were your impressions of the reintegration of the military? Uh, so, you were in Korea. Did you have any experiences with that? Oh yeah. Uh, we, uh, that was the thing for him to do. He was kind of nervy, of me, but Truman had the nerve to do it. Mm -hmm. And I, I've flown with a lot of uh, uh, colored pilots and, and hell they're just as good as anybody else. No sweat. No problem. That's good to know. Yeah. And that went smoother than everybody thought it would. Yeah. They thought it would just be hell, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, I've been close to uh, some of the uh, before the this integration thing came about. All the, the colored troops were in their own colored, but they had white officers. Mm -hmm. And hell, he got along with them just, just great. He'd have one of the biggest, uh, one of them make him first sergeant, and then he'd take care of the rest of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and isn't no problem. And hell, they were just as good of troops as uh, uh, the ones that flew out of uh, Tuskegee down there and had a fighter group in World War II. They uh, were real good. They got a lot of praise out of them. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, I guess we're skipping back now okay, back to that's Kennedy. Okay. Um, so, what was, if any, were your roles during the escalation of the conflict in Vietnam? Oh, 
Well, we, it was a good time in, in Japan because we went back to like the Army was before the war, where we had Wednesday afternoon off and Saturday afternoon off. And we'd, uh, every, everybody just having a good time, you know. Mm -hmm. And a little bit of trading, that's about all. Uh, and uh, of course, when the uh, North Koreans walked across the border up there, started the war, that all changed, of course. Mm -hmm. Everybody went on 24 7. That's the Korean War, right? Yeah, Korean War. Yeah. Uh, where were you whenever you first uh, became aware of the the Vietnam War? Oh, let's see. When did that? Well, we really started escalating in in the early '60s, uh, and then I was in, I guess, in Boston, and a friend of mine was sent over there to what they called to be an instructor or some mm -hmm. damn thing. You know, that's where they always start. Right. Uh, send a few troops over there and then they send some more and the next thing you know we're just... Right. Everything goes up. And uh, he was over there, uh, I don't know, maybe a year or so. And he came back, and by uh, that time they had escalated the, the war a little bit, and uh, Johnson found some issues to escalate it by thinking that if they fired at some of our ships <laughs> over there in the Gulf of Tonkin. Tonkin, yeah. yeah. We got involved in a little bit of, uh, of that, putting, uh, pl planning on putting radar over there in Vietnam, but we never, never did pursue it any further than that. Yeah. So, um, is the war you retired from the Air Force in sixty seven, right? So sixty eight. Sixty eight. Yeah. So that was really at, at the pinnacle of the war in Vietnam. Right. So um uh how did your roles escalate with the war? Um what was your major roles during the Vietnam conflict? Oh three years before I retired I was assigned to the uh, Inspector General's office in Andrews, and uh, we were uh, doing what Inspector General do go to try to find something wrong with some outfits, you know, and we inspected all of the. Uh, uh, Andrews had a a lot of. Uh, uh, see. What the hell do they call them? Uh, sites, oh, laboratories, yeah. where they, they had one in, in Albuquerque, uh, New Mexico, uh, where they had did research on chimpanzees and so forth. Mm -hmm. Both of them were used for the space program, though. Oh, yeah, yeah. And we had oh, one of the laboratories in Alaska at Fairbanks that <coughs> did research on clothing for cold. And they had a big old tub about the size of that living room in there that had big tucks of ice in it. And they'd get a guy all dressed up in those clothes and throw him in that <laughs> tub <laughs> see how long it was for you. He said, get me out of here. <laughs> <laughs> and they were telling us how uh, all the different kinds of materials that they tested, you know. And one of them was to take uh, uh, waterproof cloth, cloth of some sort and put real fine feathers between them and 
and then sew them together, you know. Yeah. And I said to this lady that was telling us about this, I said, where do you get the feathers? And she said, from the feather merchants. <laughs> <laughs> and then she laughed. She said, I've been going to say that for a long time. <laughs> but they, <clears throat> they had uh, dogs that they... Esk uh, Eskimo dogs, you know, mm -hmm. had wolves, had a bear, studied their uh, hibernation habits, and uh, it was all interesting, but I, I didn't see where it mattered a hell of a lot as far as the Air Force was concerned. And they had uh, one box about as long as this table here and about this wide, and a screen across here. And it had Arctic foxes in there, little ones. Hmm. And they said, they can't handle those at all. Said, they're just, just vicious, they can be. <laughs> <laughs> but they, one of the, the guys that was in charge of all of this was a veterinary student um, he was a veterinarian, but he was a graduate of Texas A&M. And he came out there to see us, and he had a coyote in his arms, a little one, you know. And I thought they were pretty vicious, but no, he's just like a pup, you know. Mm -hmm. I guess he probably got uh, more vicious when he gets older, but <laughs> he was, you could just play with him like it. <laughs> It's like a little dog. Interesting. But but they wouldn't go close to the to the wolves that they had. They had a, each one was tied to a house that they stayed in. And but it was far enough away that the thing that they had around their neck and the time to this house, they couldn't reach this other dog because if they did they'd fight like hell, you know. Mm -hmm. So they were all scattered out. Well, so you were involved in, in some research during that time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and we had a research outfit down in, in Florida testing different kinds of explosives. And uh, uh, I had never seen some of those explosives that they had, but uh, the ones we used in, in World War II were great big bombs, you know. Mm -hmm. But down there they were using just oh, about, about that big, you know, a whole cluster of them. Mm -hmm. And they were, uh, when they explode, they really explode uh, all over the place. And uh, we had medical research um, outfit down in San Antonio and had one out there in uh, California uh, out there close to P Palm Springs that uh, tested parachutes mm. and it, it was interesting to me to go to all those places and I I'd never gotten involved in all of those. It was pretty nice. But I hated to be in, the, in that um, business, Inspector General. Uh, I was usually the uh, team leader, and I had to brief the colonel and the general uh, who had left. Tell them the things we found, you know, mm -hmm. and then we go back to our our headquarters, Andrews, and write the report and send it to them, and, and then they would write the what they had, had done to correct whatever we said was wrong. Mm. And briefing the generals was easy because they didn't give you any static, but briefing the colonels was a pain. Because they wanted to make a name for themselves, I guess they challenged every, everything you, you said. 
the generals knew they'd been through that before, so they they didn't uh, worry about it. Mm. No matter what we found, they didn't care. <laughs> yeah. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. Um, you brought up a, a point that um, I wanted to talk about. Have you ever had the parachute out of your plane? No. No. Luckily. No. That's good. Never. Uh, I always said that the only thing that get me out of that airplane was planes on fire. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> I stay with it. <laughs> well, it's fortunate that that never happened. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you witnessed a lot of changes in American society between, you know, World War Two, Korea, uh, Vietnam. What was your impressions of the Americans' reaction during Vietnam, as opposed to the support in World War Two? Well, I think by the time that the, the Vietnam thing came along, a lot of people think, well, what the hell are we doing over there? Because, uh, in World War Two, they thought we were doing the right thing, and had tremendous support, but uh, the Vietnam, they just couldn't get, get with it, and uh, I agree. That we, yeah, every place we go, or since World War, since Korea, we've just messed up the country, that's what we've done. The government, we, you can't establish a government. <laughs> <laughs> Unless the people want that. Mm. And right now, we're facing uh, Iraq. The same thing. Because we destroyed their government, although it was uh, vicious and everything. But the people there were more content than they are right now. So, you fought against fascism, and you fought against communism. <laughs> <laughs> kind of the two great evils of the 20th century in many ways. Um, what was your impressions during all of that against the war against communism? I don't think we had too much... Uh, 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 I know during World War II, we didn't have too much thoughts about that. And we listened to Axis Sally on the radio, and uh, she would talk about things, and we'd listen to her. And But uh, as far as uh, getting close to communism was in Korea, when the communists mm -hmm. came across there. And if politicians had had guts enough to trust MacArthur, we would probably finished off that North Korean war. Because he had the idea that you go to war to win, mm -hmm. not just to fight a little bit and Try to keep it, and that's that's all we were doing is to try to keep them out of South Korea. Yes. So and I, and I, so. I think that was in Vietnam. Hell, the French couldn't do anything with them. We and they were there for a long time, and. We didn't, couldn't do anything with them. <laughs> they kicked us out. Mm -hmm. I remember seeing on television the uh, helicopter evacuating people out there as fast as they could. Yeah, that was terrible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yep. So, you spent 25 years 
in the Air Force or what would become the Air Force. Um, what did you do after retirement? How did you readjust after so oh, long? Well, that was... Uh, I retired from the Air Force primarily because my wife uh, was suffering from Alzheimer's disease. And so uh, when I retired, I got a job on the space program. Uh, setting up communications around the world, getting ready for the uh, moon landing. And uh, uh, back then, we didn't have, like I say, uh, communications from satellites. We had uh, uh, communications from Florida, Spain, the Indian Ocean, in the middle of the ocean, and Australia, in the middle of the Pacific, and then to uh, United States, mm -hmm. and we, uh, it was all real slow. Nowadays it's almost instant, you know. If you remember when they, they the first uh, uh, space shots, when they landed out there in the ocean, well, we didn't see anything for, until the ships got there. Mm -hmm. But later, hell, we saw them coming up down, you know. That, of everything, but communications uh, improved a heck of a lot, and that, and I was in that for two years, and the office I was working in moved in way over the other side of Washington D.C., and I quit the space program and went to work for the Board of Education in Maryland. And uh, I was over there uh, in Maryland. One whole county is one school system, okay. and one superintendent, and uh, people that worked for him there ran the, the payroll, the accounting system, the budget, and all that sort of stuff for all of the 120 schools. And we had 80,000 students. And the employees, of the payroll we ran was about 7,000 people. Mm -hmm. We paid them when I first went to work there once a month, at the end of the month. And they didn't like that. They wanted to make it every two weeks, like everybody else. So, when I was hired uh, the school system, I was the, uh, I was a system analyst. I was supposed to design another uh, accounting system. And the guy that hired me then, they fired him and put me <laughs> in his place. And uh, then for 10 years, I was the director of uh, computer operation, ran the payroll, the county system, and all the other uh, systems. As soon as we get one system operating, why? Someone come along and say, well, we got to account for all the, the furniture. Well, we made a program, I mean, a, a system for that. And then we got to keep account of all the books. And we got, made one for that, you know. And ordered library books. We had to have a system for that. So we wound up with a whole bunch of different systems. And they all, they all work, um, but that communications—I mean that 
computer system was not even anything like what people experience today. We had a, a room that had a great big uh, system of cabinets, with big tapes, and a big printer to print all that stuff out. And uh, we wrote the programs to make those that possible. I had about uh, 12 programmers that wrote the programs. Interesting. And yeah. then, uh, but what, by that time, uh, in, at the end of working there 12 years, she got real bad. And I had to retire, I took care of her for three years as a caretaker, and it, then it got to where I couldn't do it anymore. Uh, I had to put her in a nursing home. That's tough. And she lived in there for seven years. Mm -hmm. Finally passed away in Ninety-two. We were married for forty-six years. Do you have a Do you have a favorite memory of time with you and your wife, your first wife? Oh yeah, we uh, we had lots of lots of fun. Uh, yes, but uh, aside from the moves, while we were in Japan, we got to to. Uh, visit Tokyo, and we had uh, uh, the army had taken over some of the uh, mountain hotel resorts for people to go up there on vacation. Mm -hmm. And the Japanese ran it, but the army ran them, <laughs> I guess. And we could. Uh, apply and get reservations there and go and uh, and stay and they had usually entertainment of some sort uh, on weekends and very good food and we enjoyed all of that and when it, we were in Germany we got to <coughs> visit lots of we got to visit uh, uh, Holland, Paris, Italy, and Versus Gardens uh, down in the, uh, in Germany, and that was always fun. We go down to every every chance we could get, <laughs> and so we had had a good time there until. Well, I guess right up to the time that the, uh, I left, or we left, we came back with on an airplane. Well, they didn't have jet airplanes yet. Jet passengers got on an airplane in Wiesbaden with the. Uh, four-year-old and a one-month-old boy. Yeah. And we came back to New York and then that's when I dropped them off at, at uh, her folks and I came on down to Stillwater then to yeah, old a and yeah. But yeah, we had a good, I enjoyed Germany, had a good time. Had lots of, lots of good parties. And lots of good places to eat. 
Seems like the two of you led very fulfilled lives. <laughs> so you've seen more of the world than most. You've seen so much of the world that I'm envious. Have you seen this thing around the border? I did see yeah. that. Um, after all the places in the world that you've been to, that you've visited, that you've flown over, what brings you back to Stillwater, Oklahoma? Well, after my wife passed away in the She was in the nursing home in Grove, Oklahoma, over here, when she passed away. And she's buried over there in Buzzard Cemetery. It's named Buzzard because the Indian who owned that land before was named Buzzard. Hmm. <laughs> when they took it away from him and made their cemetery, <laughs> they named it the Buzzard Cemetery. Anyway, uh, I was a uh, an old girlfriend uh, in Texas got in touch with me. Her husband had died, and this was after my wife had died. And we had gone together when I was in training at Fort Worth back the start of the war, and. So I moved to Texas and was down there. And we had gotten married, and then she passed away. Mm. Kidney failure. And so I was living there by myself in Texas, and I, my family was trying to get me to move up close to where they were in Maryland. I said, no, I don't want to move up there. <laughs> and I came up here and I picked up a big uh, book that had all of the alumni in it. And I looked up my third wife and she was in there. And I called her, talked to her. Her husband was, was uh, deathly ill. And after we talked, I guess it was about six months, he passed away. And then we got more friendly. And I moved up here before we got married. And then after nine years with her, she passed away it's two tough. years ago. My condolences is on all yeah. three. Yeah. And so I'm still here. <laughs> I bought this house uh, right after I came up here. And she had a house up on the hill. And after we got married, why well, we decided to keep both houses. And this one then turned into primarily a hotel for my vested relatives. <laughs> and so I kept it uh, kept it going. And then after she passed away, why well, then I moved everything down here. Everything I had up there down here. Well, Mr. Russell, you've you've lived through so much history. You've participated in some of the most monumentous to historical events in the 20th century. Whenever history is written about you, what would you like people to know from your experiences? Well, one of these things here has. If I could live my life over, <laughs> <laughs> you ought to get that out. <laughs> and then, I, I don't know. I guess, uh, like my dad said, when 
he was just about on his deathbed. He said, well, I've had a good life. And Mom always appreciated that. Uh, so I guess in spite of all of the ups and downs and everything, why it's been a positive life. I never have accomplished a whole hell of a lot, but I've had <laughs> well, enjoyed that. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I haven't. <laughs> but it's been been kind of fun in a way. I've been putting some of this stuff in those binders that I want to keep. Some of it is nothing to do with the military life, but just things I want to keep. And if you want to look at them, you can be my guest. I appreciate that yeah. offer. So. You know, we spoke about thanking servicemen the last time that... Thanking what? About the American public saying thank you to servicemen. Yeah. We discussed that in our last interview briefly. What was your impression the first time that you heard thank you? <laughs> I don't really know, but it kind of thrilled me in a way that no one has ever said that to me before. And I, I guess I really appreciated it, really did. Although I tried not to make a deal out of it. But uh, it was just so spontaneous, you know, that she said that. Uh, my coffee group down there on Tuesday, they, they found out that I was over there in England during the uh, invasion on the 6th of June. And in the Sunday school, one of the guys said, we got uh, a guy here that was in the, that invasion, Charles Russell. And <laughs> everybody clapped. So <laughs> and people looked at me and thought, oh, that's all it is. <laughs> People that hadn't talked to me at all uh, came up and said something to me. And that was, I guess, kind of nice in a way. And so then one of the guys had me to talk about that at the other coffee group. And when I got through, uh, one of the, the guys turned to me and said, thank you for your service. And I didn't expect that either. <laughs> that was a hell. I guess that's what things I remember. Is there anything throughout the, this interview process that we haven't uh, gotten to talk about yet that you maybe wanted to talk about? Oh, I guess I've talked too much already. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm always here to listen. Right? <laughs> well, in someone listening to what I have said here, uh, we just skim the, the top of it, uh, making those things happen and so forth. Uh, there's a whole lot more to it than what I just had to brush over it. Yeah. So, if there's one aspect that you'd like to dive into, what would that be? Oh, I don't know. Uh, don't know. <laughs> Yeah. 
Well, you know, for for someone who hasn't experienced what you experience, and for someone as naturally curious as myself, and you know, I I know so many people who are very interested in learning from the wisdom of an experienced veteran such as yourself. You yeah. know, uh, there are people who are genuinely interested and really care. What could, beyond what we've talked about? What could you add to help us understand? Well, I, I guess some of these things that I have, have written uh, is more detailed than, than what I just talked about here. Absolutely. And uh, here's one I right hear that was in said that book that uh, you probably read that. Mm -hmm. Uh, and well, I look forward to reading some of your written work, <laughs> and I hope that this interview process has done some sense of service to you. And um, once again, I'd like to thank you for your service to your country, and on behalf of my countrymen, thank you. And mm -hmm. once again, I'd like to thank you for sharing your experiences with us and for opening up your life and giving us access to this information. Um, thank you so much. Okay.